thing we desire is already within us. You have the power and the energy to create the life you desire in you. You're the first man that I ever loved. God sent me to you a gift from above. See, there's nothing like a father's love. I'm so thankful to the stars above. God gave me to you and you to me. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have this family. You raised me up and taught me the ways that I should go. And even though you're gone, you promised to never let go. Said you'd always be the best man that I know. No matter how far that I go. No matter how old that I grow. You know you always be my hero. The best I have some things to share with you that I've never shared before publicly with anybody. Tarleton, you die for what you believe. Jesus is the savior of the world, the whole world, all men. He's affecting the world, the world. He's a pastor that thinks world, and that's what God wants. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. If he didn't condemn, why do we? That's all I'm saying. Brother, we ain't just here to have a little meeting. God's called this thing. God's saying, all right, 
I want you to walk in the footprints that are already there. You create some new ones. B.E. Paul is, is one of my spiritual sons. He's my first expansion consciousness son. When Bishop Pearson transitioned, a lot is on my shoulders now. And I don't perceive myself as the successor of Carlton Pearson. I perceive it as a succession. But there, has, there have to be some voices who can speak and know what he taught and give it and be able to answer the questions. I know that he prepared me for this moment. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in the room, Ch Churin. Get somewhere and sit down, as Bishop CDP would tell us. Get up off uh, of that stuva. How your mama, how your mama them? How you doing? How you living? How you dying? We're glad uh, that you're here tonight. Welcome to uh, Bishop Carlton D. Pearson's The Gospel of Inclusion. I am your host, Bishop uh, D. E. Polk. You just heard uh, Miss Majesty Pearson, Carlton's uh, daughter, her new song, New release, uh, new release, always be, uh, singing to her father that he would always be uh, her hero. It's hard to listen to that voice. It sounds a little bit uh, to me like Mufasa speaking to Simba. Uh, just a lot of wisdom. Uh, we know that Bishop Pearson is only one iteration uh, away from us, and maybe he's even on the other side making some, some things happen for us. Who knows? Who, who knows what God is doing right now? Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about uh, quantum awakenings. What does that really mean? What, does, what is quantum? What is an awakening? Uh, I want to welcome all those who are here uh, for the first time. If you're curious, uh, then you're in the right space. Uh, inclusion is drawing its circle a little bit bigger right now. We are, of course, still interested in expanding consciousness, but we are also interested in uh, laying down um, a framework uh, or an, an architecture that includes those who are curious right now. Maybe, maybe you're in traditional uh, religious uh, structure. Maybe you have um, been indoctrinated biblically for generations. Uh, if you are in any sense of, of, of deconstruction or reconstruction, you're welcome at the table tonight. I will remind uh, those of us tonight who are uh, followers of Bishop Pearson for many years that he did not wake up until he was about 50. Azusa was already a worldwide uh, phenomenon, internationally uh, acclaimed. And Bishop Pearson was still, <laughs> he was still talking about family values and uh, running for a political office on a very conservative platform. He was homophobic. Uh, his rhetoric against uh, certain disenfranchised and marginalized communities was offensive. And, uh, and the Spirit of God woke him up. And so how many Carlton Pearsons are out there right now? How many are just waiting on the teacher to appear when the student is ready? the teacher will appear. And so as we draw our circle bigger, you're welcome here. Your questions are welcome. Your critique uh, is welcome. You may be a Nicodemus who comes to Jesus at night uh, under the cover of darkness, or, may, or you may be even a little cautiously concerned. Whatever it is, we're glad uh, that you're at the table uh, tonight. Quantum Awakenings. Welcome once again to Bishop Carlton D. Pearson's uh, The Gospel of Inclusion. Are you awake? Are you fully awake? Uh, are you just partially awake? Are you like a zombie, uh, kind of uh, the walking dead, still kind of bumping into people and still a little bit religiously conditioned and uh, using the Bible uh, to, to justify the things that you want, but maybe not seeing uh, it in, in its totality? I am of the, uh, of the persuasion that when you wake up in one area of your life, it can be applied to all areas. Let me give you just a real quick uh, historical uh, glance at awakenings. The first human awakening contained all the other awakenings in it. What does that mean? And I, I'm not sure that I would want to argue what the first awakening was. There were probably many. Let's, let's just take slavery for, for an example. When humanity woke up, or at least part of humanity woke up to the truth that we cannot put people in hierarchies, we cannot suggest that some people are more or less worthy of freedom, the pursuit of happiness and liberty, when we realize this is an ugly part of our human experience, all of the awakenings, the other awakenings were contained in that one awakening. But look at how we had to do. 
Uh, we woke up to to this idea of equality in the human family. And then, you know, maybe a hundred years later or so, then we have to go through, uh, through women's rights. Okay, now we've got to realize that a woman has the same rights as a man and should be paid the same and has the same, uh, same power, the same uh, capacity. Okay, then we had to wake up to, to gay rights. Okay, so we've gone from, from hu human rights or civil rights to women's rights, then to, uh, then to gay, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, rights. Then f finally, now we've got to argue about immigrants' rights. What are the rights of immigrants? There is a pattern of history that continues to repeat itself, and there is no new learning. All of the learning is in the first awakening. You can take that framework of the first awakening and apply it to your entire conscious or even subconscious and unconscious uh, mind. I'll give you a, a little, a couple of little examples uh, real quickly in uh, in our critical study of scripture, of the Bible, we find that uh, there's quite a few uh, dichotomous tropes and contradictions. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? Uh, David in the Psalms says that he was born in sin, shapen in iniquity. He comes back later, Psalm 139 or so, and he says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. They're both in the same Bible, both in the same book written by the same author, are we shaped in sin or are we fearfully uh, or wonderfully made? When we begin to study uh, the Pauline epistles, Paul says to us that he is a wretched man who will deliver me from this body, this sinful body of death, the thing I wish to do or I should do, I don't do it. The thing that I should do, I don't do that thing. And then he comes back later and says, beholding in the mirror the glory of God. So which Paul do you read? Is it the Paul that's the wretched man, or is it the Paul that is the image and likeness of God? All right, this is a little touchy, so, so hang with me right here. But we sense even in Jesus of Nazareth uh, some very uh, uh, con contradicting type teachings. Jesus is, uh, he is misogynistic in his cultural uh, conditioning. He is xenophobic. Jesus is in some ways hierarchical. Uh, and some of his expressions. So what do you mean? Do you talk to me about that? Okay. So Jesus uh, is approached by a Syrophoenician woman. This is in the Gospel of John. And uh, she says, Jesus, my daughter is troubled. Will you, will you pray for her? And he says, send this woman away. Why is she bothering me? I only, I did not come for you or your people. I only came for my people, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus, the name Jesus in English is that is uh, translated as Joshua, Yeshua or Joshua, which is which means the savior of his people. So stay with me. The angel said, call him Jesus, but the prophet said, call him Emmanuel. When they called him Jesus, he acted like Jesus, culturalized, tribalistic, uh, xenophobic, uh, hierarchical. But the Emmanuel was waking up on the inside of him. When he went to Jacob's well, he looked at the Samaritan woman and said, God is spirit. We can worship on your mountain. We can worship in my synagogue. It doesn't matter. Everywhere we are, God is. God is spirit. Let's worship in spirit and in truth. So which Jesus do you read? Do you read the son of man who was culturally conditioned? Or do you attach yourself more to the son of God who was waking up, as Paul would say, uh, once perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation. And so... As we study the Bible, we must consider the idea that we are not engaging in a contest of accuracy, but more so in a revealing of consciousness. What do I mean by that? Okay, so if there are contradictions all over the Bible, then we can't argue about accuracy because we can prove anything we want from the same Bible. So what does it become? Okay, it becomes a revealing of consciousness. Why am I more attracted to the Jesus who is xenophobic than I am to the Jesus who is inclusive? Why am I more attracted to the Paul who is a wretched man than the Paul who is beholding the glory of God in the mirror? It's not a contest of accuracy. It's a revealing of consciousness. In essence, the Bible becomes a mirror for us, not necessarily showing us who God is, but revealing to us who we are. When we look at the Bible, we find out who we are. So how do we apply that to quantum 
uh, awakenings. We're going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk tonight with my brother. Some of you have maybe saw the Instagram and social media uh, post, um, and we'll get in, we'll get into to, to some of this as well. Uh, but I was uh, 13 years old when I met uh, my brother. Uh, we met at church, and uh, within a couple of months, he had moved into our house. And my, my father kind of became his father. Uh, he lived with us throughout high school, and then uh, he went away to play basketball in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but would still stay the summers with us. And so he is my brother. I call him my brother. He calls my children his niece and nephew. Uh, we are connected. We slept in the same bed even as adults. <laughs> he, he's 6'8", so he can't sleep in a queen-size bed or a single bed. And so when he comes to stay with us uh, here in Atlanta, we just, my wife goes and sleeps in another bed and he sleeps in the bed with me. He's my six, eight brother. We're, we're going to put him on the couch. His feet going to be hanging all into the kitchen. Um, but I want to show you a video uh, that, that my brother, Louis Lamar, uh, made for my father's 85th birthday, who he, he sees as a very much a father figure to him. Uh, we, we played many different people sent in videos for my father's 85th birthday None of the videos touched our hearts like this video. My entire family, entire church was in tears listening to the heartfelt um, happy birthday from Louis Lamar to, to our dad, who he calls Uncle Don, but uh, sees as a father figure. I want to introduce to you tonight my brother Louis Lamar. Watch this video. So blessed to be a part of your family and for you to have embraced me as your own son as well. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Uncle Don, I'm trying my best not to cry, but I just want you to know, you've been a wonderful person to me since I've known you. You actually bought me my first car. Um, not even my dad or my mom did that for me and they both were living. You helped me buy my first car. There's some regrets that I have that I live with and I think about often. I wish that I had included you more into my recruiting process, but I just want you to know that I love you. And I always will. I always love you. I always love your family. I love your children. I love your wife. I love what you stood for, and what you stand for, and who you are, and what you are, and what you mean to all of us. I'll always love you, and I will always defend that. I really appreciate you so much. Thank you so much, Uncle D. You're the best, man. You're absolutely the most amazing man I know, and I love you. Thank you. I've, I've seen that video probably a hundred times, and it still, it still touches me. Welcome to uh, Bishop Carlton D. Pearson's The Gospel of Inclusion, my brother. Uh, Lewis Ronald Lamar Jr. Welcome, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and I don't even know if I even told you this yet, DE, but I've changed my name. Yeah. My name is now Peace Lewis Lamar. Peace Lewis Lamar. I have okay. decided that I, more than anything in my life, peace is the most important thing for me. I've hmm. uh, been through enough life that. I demand that I won't let anything disturb it. So yes, thank you. I'm so glad to be here, See Bishop peace, Paul. Pursue it. <laughs> that is a, a title I'm getting used to. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna start with a little bit of fun tonight. Um, I'm gonna tell you some uh, nicknames that I had for uh, for my brother Lewis growing up, and then he can tell all the ones that he would like to share. Sure. Uh, just to kind of pull you in. So. When we met, um, of course, I called him Lewis, but then Lewis turned into uh, Prince Lucia. Uh, <laughs> we would at night he would put my mother's string of pearls around his head and walk through our house as Prince Lucia. Um, he doesn't like this one, but he's go he's going to forgive me because I'm his brother. Um, You've been not say Manute Bowl. I, I called him Manute. <laughs> called him Manute. <laughs> But if you guys remember Manute Bowl, he was a 7'7 player in the NBA, and Lewis was 6'8, so he, you know, he grew so fast, he was very thin. I would so literally, skinny. I would yell Manute Bowl, and then I would run, and he would chase me <laughs> through the parking lot trying to punch me. 
but we we called each other a lot of things. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll let you have your turn, Lewis. Go ahead. Oh man, I don't know. Then you know everybody called me Lil Louie because my dad was Big Louie, and um, <clears throat> I don't know. It was I've had a few different names. <laughs> Some that I'm proud of, some I am not. Um, when I was in high school, I had this this tooth that was brown that wouldn't come out. <laughs> and I got it knocked out going into my senior year. <laughs> and every once in a while, somebody would call me Snaggle. So, you know, I got that too. But So what, um, what were your nicknames for me, Lewis? Uh, white Bread. White Bread, there we go. Um, biscuit Head. <laughs> Let's see. Um it all depends. You know, you went through a couple of phases where you were pretty pudgy at one time. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, I called you, I thought you looked like, I called you Duran Duran because I didn't know what else to call you. <laughs> um, I don't know. There was a few other names, but other than that, we, you know, we called you Larry Bird the second because you could stroke it. You could shoot the ball. I was but, a white boy who could play a little bit. So uh, was, Lewis and I... Um, became very close at a time. Uh, our ch The church that I was raised in was the second racially integrated church in America, only behind uh, Dr. Howard Thurman's church in San Francisco. And so he and I were raised as brothers. We walked around malls and people would look at us strangely and I would have to calm him down because they would, they would call me uh, a certain thing that I can't say out loud. Um, and they would call him, uh, you know, a cracker or betraying his race. And of course he was six, eight and would ready to put his hands on somebody. And my job was to keep him cool most of the time. Um, but it was an interesting dynamic watching and Lewis will remember s some of this, uh, once when our church in, when our church welcomed, um, our first, uh, black family, uh, many of our white members left, uh, they did mm -hmm. not want to be part of integration. And then in the 70s, our church began to ordain women into full-time ministry. That may seem normal now, but in the 70s, it was very controversial. Many of the men became mad. When our church welcomed uh, the gay community, many of our straight members left, both uh, black and white members left the church. And then oddly, oddly enough, when we welcomed the interfaith community, some of our same gender uh, loving uh, co uh, community members left. And so each step along the way, we sense this kind of, I want to be included, but once I'm included, I'd have no, I have no issue excluding someone else and really using right. the same Bible uh, that was used against me uh, to disenfranchise people of different, uh, different cultures, different sexual orientation. One of the things I'm really proud about with my brother is that he's been in the, uh, he's been in the medical industry for many years. But he's done quite a bit of work in the Native American community uh, in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, in Placitas, in the Pueblos that are on the outlying uh, places of Albuquerque. Talk to us about your uh, experience in having to understand different cultures and how maybe us growing up together had anything to do with that. Sure, sure. Just to give you a quick background, um, you know, the official day that I first met D.E. Uh, face to face was... Um, February 17, 2000, excuse me, 1986. Mm. February 17th, 1986, at the John Park Harris building. Um, they were just getting out of choir rehearsal, and I met Aunt Clarice first. And my dad was saying, well, I want to introduce you to his, her son, and he'll be up here. Maybe he'll be up here in a second, and we'll go down to the gym. And then that's when you came up. and. I'll never forget that moment uh, when we met each other. We kind of looked at each other up and down, and we just hugged each other. Um, my dad was kind of taken back from, I'm sure your mom was as well. And uh, from that moment there, we've been best of friends and been brothers ever since then. Um, you know, growing up at Chapel Hill or, or the cathedral and growing up in the environment that we, that we were in uh, during that time, you know, I had never been around white people before at all during that time. Uh, I think the first white person, first experience I had with a white person was a little boy. His dad asked me over by um, Rice Park, way on the other side of town, asked me if uh, um, I remember his dad said, that's a little, a little 
<laughs> the nigga if he wants a if he wants a coke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went back and I asked my grandmother, my step grandmother. I said, "Asie, what's a nigga?" And she she goes, "Where you hear that word from?" And she went back and she, I told her who who I heard it from, and she went down the street with me, barefoot and all. <laughs> and she proceeded to slap this man. I'll never forget it. Mm. But that was my first experience. And then going to, when I made the decision to go to New Mexico, we lived in Cherry Ridge subdivision right there off of Flesh Shows Parkway, uh, Jason from the from the, the college, and then right around down the street from the main cathedral, main uh, facility. And um, I had a chance to see this the Spanish workers or the Mexican workers who were building the homes in which we were living in the community there. And uh, I had committed to go to New Mexico and I was trying to make sure I was listening to some of the words so that way I can communicate some of the Spanish that I learned from Senior Murian uh, while we were in school. And then uh, I remember coming to New Mexico, it was, uh, it was very different because, you know, living where we live, our whole world was from Rainbow Drive on the far end side, going towards Soft the Cab Mall, all the way to Wesley Chapel, mm -hmm. which was at the end of our street, Flash Horse Parkway. So that whole area from there all the way to Rainbow Drive, that was literally our domain for those years that we were in mm -hmm. school, unless we decided we had a game. I played AAU basketball, we played baseball, or we were doing something with the family. But for the most part, we were in that area. So we didn't venture out very much. And then we were I was very protective of anything beyond those limits because I grew up in Southwest Atlanta. And being who I was and my dad and being through the community and what I've learned, I was extremely protective over DE, uh, making sure he didn't feel any intimidation whatsoever. But when I came to New Mexico, I realized how I didn't realize how big the melting pot was. Hmm. And in New Mexico, we have multiple races of people here. Of course, we have your, your blacks, your whites, your Hispanics, but we also have uh, East Indian, we have Africans, we have Germans, Russians, Chinese, different Asians uh, here in New Mexico. But the group that I tended to uh, migrate tours or became very familiar with due to my occupation was the Native American community. Was I, I was new to the Native American community to an extent, but not as much because my grandmother and my grandfather were Native. Uh, it came from uh, the Oklahoma area. And this is things that I, these are, these are things that I found out as I got older. But there were, tw there were 26 tribes and pueblos here in the state of New Mexico. Wow. If you haven't heard of the four corners, that is Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, which is forms the four corners. And in those four corners, there's a large population of natives called Navajo, which is also called Navajo Nation. And then you have all your many, all your different tribes and pueblos and having to understand and juggle the relationships and making sure that you didn't have certain groups with each other because there's still a lot of hurt feelings. There's a lot of things that are there, a little bit of animosity uh, from turmoil from back in the day, things that have happened that has caused confidence to, to change amongst the groups. And um, I've become friends because I worked in the medical laboratory space and we wanted their specimens to be at our lab. And so I got a chance to meet a lot of the, the um, the leadership in those in those tribes and pueblos, and so based upon that, there's so much that has happened yeah. because of those relationships. Even a company was developed that's still going forward, that's going strong uh, because of the relationships that I've developed with the Native American community. But having to, you know, walk through the areas of knowing how to respect, how to show homage and and admiration and be sensitive to cultural differences mm -hmm. is very important. And living here for the last 33, almost 34 years, I've had to adapt to those things and learn those things very significantly yeah. because you can offend someone and that could cause you a lot of problems mm -hmm. in, in, in the workspace that I was in. But yes, 
I've got a chance to meet a lot, a lot of people in those communities. One of the things that, that uh, Lewis and I reflect on about learning cultural uh, sensitivities was our relationship. You know, we mm -hmm. were we were just kids, and uh, at some point, uh, we just started asking each other questions that were we didn't know if they were racially um, uh, insensitive or not. But Lewis would ask me. Why don't white people like to wear shoes? Or why do you want to be in the sun? Or uh, why do you? Oh my goodness. And so I would say, well, I don't know. I would try to explain what I knew of white people. I didn't know a lot of white people other than my cousins. But, uh, and then I would say, Lewis, why are black people so loud? Why do they talk in movies? <laughs> and he would say, well, let me explain how our, my culture. And so I would, he would take me to to soul food restaurants and introduce me to oxtails and and you know delicacies that I hadn't eaten before and I would introduce him to laying out in the sun and he would put oh, suntan lotion goodness. on. Uh, uh, but all of that, even though we were kids, there was a sense of there was a safe space with us, and yes. we were able to because we loved each other. We wanted to understand more, and sometimes I think whether it's whether it's racial whether it is about sexual orientation, religious, uh, cultural, it could be gender. Sometimes we just need to be brave enough to ask questions uh, in, in a safe space. Help me understand. Help me apply uh, what, what, uh, what I've learned. And uh, hopefully that's something that, we, that can apply to, to other uh, areas as well. Did you want to share anything else, Lewis? No, I was just going to say one of the things that was really important in growing up you know, we didn't have these conversations right off the bat. We had to learn one another. We we mm -hmm. learned to be in each other's space. And I learned so much about the cultural differences in DE's home versus the home that I lived in. You know, I'll never forget this one moment. Uh, and every once in a while, I remind my kids or I remind myself of it. I remember one of the first things that scared me to death is that DE did not have to ask for certain things in the house to have to eat. <laughs> and growing up the way I grew up, we had to ask for everything. If I wanted a cup of water, I had to say, Mama, can I have a glass of water? Or Mama, can I have a cookie? Or can I have this? Or can I have that? We asked for every single thing. And in his household, he didn't have to ask unless it was something that was needed when it came to having <laughs> actual paper money in his head to make a transaction or to do something. So I'll never forget this. If you remember Chips Ahoy cookies, chocolate chip cookies used to come in a package with two sleeves of cookies in it. We have this thing that we like to eat called chilk. And what that is, is you take a tall glass, you take a whole sleeve of cookies, you put it in, this, in a glass, you crunch it all up. Well, DE proceeded to do this and he goes, buddy, you do yours. I was like, uh-uh, you're not about to get me in trouble eating all those, that whole pack of cookies. <laughs> Are you sure we can have these cookies, man? Did you talk to your mom and dad? Did you, I gotta ask to make sure, cause I don't wanna get a whipping. I don't want to get put on restriction. I don't want you to tell my dad because my dad will whoop my butt. And I didn't want that happening. And I didn't want to have get embarrassed in those things. He was like, no, buddy, listen, you can have this. This, this is just cookies. Mm -hmm. And that was so different for me Yeah. in that, in that experience. Mm -hmm. And I remember he took, the, he took the package of cookies, opening them up himself because I literally refused to do it. He put the cookies in the glass, chopped them all up, put the milk in and says, now eat, buddy. I was like, Man, I hope you I hope you're sure about this because I was so scared. <laughs> so that has changed something in my life, right? Yeah. You know, we pick up on these things. We learn. I have four kids. I have my son is 14 years old, the same age I was when I left home to go live with my father. He has done the same thing. He lives with me. My son does not have to ask to have a pack of cookies. He doesn't have to mm -hmm. have ask to have cookies. He doesn't need to ask to have water. Doesn't, you know, if it's here, right. it's yours. That's the motto that I have. If it's mine, it's yours. And uh, he reminds me of that sometimes. What's yours is mine, <laughs> even though it's mine still. But the fact is, he does not have to ask. So those were some cultural differences that we had back then. I'll never forget sitting out in the suntan, doing a suntan. I'll never forget this, guys. <laughs> I tried putting on baby, baby oil, uh -huh. body oil, yep. and I fell asleep. On the Cassidy's balcony on their deck, <laughs> and I had sunburn. I didn't know black people could get sunburn. <laughs> sure enough, I got it. 
Well, on one occasion, uh, I would Lewis and I would go to get our haircut. So I went to pretty much I went to a white barber shop, and they would like I were kind of a flat top, and then I would go with Lewis to get his haircut at a at a uh, traditionally uh, black, historical black barber shop, and so. At one time uh, we were we had a game and we both wanted to look like we hadn't had a haircut but we wanted to kind of trim up our lines or whatever so I said Lewis just take the take this razor and like trim my trim my hairline so he was in the back trimming my hairline seat so I said here I'll do yours now so I took a straight razor what white people shave their face with and well I was trying to edge up his his hairline in the back and by the time we got to the game for the game to start his whole neck was inflamed with bumps and keloids and and you know it's just we we learned i learned about uh that white people can actually get ashy it just doesn't show up as well <laughs> but you know, black we, people we, can get really ashy we look like get really ashy oh, every once in a while but when when you're in that safe space you know i have one of my best friends is is a gay man and he didn't come out until he was 40 because he felt the church's pressure uh, for him to be something that he was not, what he was not mm -hmm. born to be. And I don't care if it's if it's you're raised with somebody who is a different, a different race, a different sexual orientation, a different religion. There is something that all of us have to teach each other. There is something Absolutely. all of us have to learn from each other. And when we choose uh, to open up our hearts and and take our defensive walls down. Uh, we can learn from each other, and these things can be applied. I wanted to uh, to give you guys an example of something that I think is um, it's actually really sad, and I hope you don't I don't want to lower the vibration of the room right now. But uh, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had been in um, in basically in bondage or in slavery for four hundred years, and so they were only about uh, two generations out uh, out of bondage. And uh, Solomon was building a temple. And he was very specific about who was supposed to build this temple for them. And he, he called it, in the King James Version, he calls it forced laborers. But we all know that's, what is a forced laborer? Okay, slave. you can read, it's a slave, it's a slave. And so, but then Solomon gives this big explanation. First Kings chapter nine, he says, oh, no, 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 don't, don't everybody freak out. I didn't use any Hebrews as slaves. I only used the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Peruzites. In essence, Solomon was teaching us slavery is okay as long as you don't enslave your own people. So as an American, it's okay, it's okay to have slaves as long as they're Canadians or Mexicans. Or, But do you, do you see that sense of egocentrism that, mm -hmm. and if we apply that to the Bible, listen to me, the, I don't want to lose you right here. If we can look at the Bible and go, oh yes, even though the Bible teaches slavery, you know, in Christ there is no there is no male or female, there is no bond nor free. Okay, so you're able to nuance that for that specific topic. But have you applied that to women? Are women allowed to have full ordination? Have you applied that to the gay kid? Have you applied that to other religions? I have sheep of other pastures. When we only interpret the Bible to to justify ourselves then we, in essence, are weaponizing it against other people groups. And so I want us to be aware tonight that in this quantum awakening, we can all wake up at the same time. I want to read one more uh, one more thing to you, and then I'm going to uh, throw it back to you, Lewis, if you want to sh share something uh, with sure. us. But this is, uh, this is from Isaiah, uh, the book of Isaiah. And uh, it says, uh, this is where we get the idea line upon line, precept upon precept. But uh, the question before that says, whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? Here's the question. Those who are just weaned from the milk, those who are just taken from the breast. In, in essence, we are, we are given a context here scripturally that God has to feed us line upon line, precept upon precept, because we're so used to, to learning at a very slow pace. How do we apply that to tonight's quantum awakening? Okay, so line upon line is, okay, well, we learned the lesson of racism. We shouldn't be racist. We shouldn't enslave other people. We shouldn't be classist. We shouldn't, uh, shouldn't treat people like less than a human being. Okay, what's the next line? Okay, now we got to learn the women's rights thing because that's the next line. Now we got to learn the gay rights thing. Now we got to learn the immigrants' rights. Now we got to learn the interfaith thing. 
in essence, we are God is having to teach us line upon line because we are refusing the quantum awakenings. All of the learning is in the first awakening. All of the wisdom is in that first moment if we can create a framework to where we can apply that uh, to life in general. Uh, does that does that resonate with you at all, Lewis? It does. It really does. You know, I remember listening to Donnie and Reba McGuire singing a song that talked about we're not black or white, we're not bound or free, we're no earthly race, we're a brand new breed. Yeah. And uh, that has stuck with me for so long because, um, you know, I as as I got older, you know, I didn't see race. Uh, I had some some things that were being drilled into me at times and talked to me about, you know, pay attention to this and do this and do that and don't do this. You know, I'd never forget um, just some of the conversations I would have with my dad about, about life and about people and the difference of people. Um, it was hard for me to take those conversations at times because a lot of what my dad felt was rooted in some of his experiences being in Atlanta yeah. and being in Atlanta at that time was very, very, uh, had a lot of tension. How about that? Very divided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I remember he would tell me about the first time he played against a white school uh, or some of his experiences and, and, you know, with his dad or with his mom or having to be, feel like he was a second class person or so on and so forth. Those things were hard for me to understand because the relationship that I had identified and, and, and was in, in reference to, you know, being with a person of a different color, mm -hmm. my first relationship was with DE. We became best of friends almost instantaneously. It, he did not hesitate to like, let me wear his clothes or have wear a pair of his shoes or, you know, things of that nature, if I needed something, he would literally let me have it because I didn't have it. And uh, he knew that my dad couldn't give it to me at the time. So he would give me something and he didn't worry about it because he said, my mom and dad would get me more. Mm -hmm. So in those experiences and in those, in, in those exchanges of, 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 of love and, and, and the vulnerability that we share with one another, mm -hmm. I learned not to have those feelings. Now, I will say this. There were some other bugs that were put into my head mm -hmm. <laughs> in reference to other races. You know, we have this thing called systemic racism. Sure. I've experienced it myself. I experience it often, unfortunately. Um, to have to have a conversation with my kid about preparing himself having to have to deal with white people and their nastiness towards blacks because they feel threatened by us or a black man having knowledge and understanding and being able to stand on his own two feet and have a conversation and talk. It's sad. It's so sad to me that we judge people by the color of our skin, but not by the content of our, of our character mm -hmm. in reference to, you know, in the speech that Dr. King said, gave, gave us, and I have a dream. You know, I, I experience these things still today and see these things and then having to have to teach my kid about, having his head on a swivel as a young black kid at 14 years old, when I had to make him be serious and be on guard about life when he should be enjoying life. Mm -hmm. That's sad to me. That is, that's yeah. one of the things that really bothers me more than anything else. And, um, you know, I try to have these conversations and talk to him. And, and this is what's so funny because God works in mysterious ways. My little boy, is mixed. He's Hispanic and black. Okay. I have a picture of Zion with four other kids and not one of them was a pure race of a person. Mm. Okay. There's an Asian kid. There's a East Indian kid. There's a kid that was from Senegal, very dark skinned from Africa. Then Zion been mixed. And there's a little kid who was white, looked white, but he wasn't all white. And now I got a picture of these kids with their arms around one another. Hmm. And every time I look at that picture, when I think of that picture, it shows me and it tells me that God's grace is still sufficient for all of mm -hmm. us. 
Beautiful. And so in doing that and seeing that we can learn so much from these young people, mm-hmm. there's oftentimes when I look at these kids, they don't even see colors. They all, they have friends. I mean, they have the whole rainbow. They have friends who are gay. They have friends who, who just so different than what they are and watching the kids love each other and communicate with each other and mm-hmm. look out for one another. It's talks, you know, that's something different there. You yeah. know, back in the day, we used to always get this scripture. It always talked about you're going to enter the kingdom of God. You don't you have to enter the kingdom, kingdom of God with a childlike spirit. Beautiful. You know, kids don't have any qualm, any qualms of telling you the truth. They'll tell you if you have a missing tooth, they'll, oh, you're snaggletooth mm-hmm. or you're, you're black or you're this or you're white or you, your hair. What is wrong with your hair? I mean, they'll, <laughs> they'll say these things to you without even thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And it's the innocence that's in them. And for yeah. some reason, we want to kill this innocence in these kids and make them have categories of friends. If you, you know, there's a show that I watch when they say, if you can count how many people, how many black friends you have on your on one hand, you're a racist. You're a racist. <laughs> you're a racist. That's right. Uh, that's Chris Rock, I think. <laughs> that's correct. And so, you know, just having all these different things that we grew up around and yeah. having to see this tension that we still face today and mm. police brutality on on black kids. And then, you know, there's been some justice happening. I grew up in a classroom where I think there were there were a few black there was it was so mixed. And to know that we still love each other and we still communicate with each other, you know, <clears throat> I don't know how to even really get into this thought process with you because I live on a different side of the track sometimes because of who I am and what I am and how big I am. I, I put a lot of fear in people. I go to grocery stores. I watch people's kids look at me and stare at me and start crying. I looked at later. I said, you need to get your kids out a little bit longer, a little bit more. <laughs> They go, why why do you say that? I said, because they should not be afraid of me. They should actually feel comfort when they see me. Right. And I've done this on so many occasions. It's just, it's just so weird to me, but I will say this and going back to even just meeting Randy, um, someone that I didn't know who he was and at the very beginning, and then the more Randy was around Mm -hmm. us, I have to be honest with you. I felt my homophobic vibes coming out at one time. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When I was a kid and where I grew up, gay men weren't very vocal. If you were vocal and said mm-hmm. too many things out loud, you got beat up. Yeah. Okay. Um, a woman who was considered to be a lesbian, which they use another derogatory word, a different word that was in my mind is derogatory today. But for some reason we were friends with them, but we did not extend the olive branch to the male who was different. Right. Interesting. Yeah. And having to, and then being around Donnie Earl and the family and being around other men who mm-hmm. we thought were a little effeminate mm-hmm. uh, versus the masculinity that was spewing out of our blood, out of our pores every day. And the ones, mm-hmm. the people that we were around, it was somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, I have to say this, and um, I'm very appreciative today because I remember when things really hit the fan and DE decided to branch off and he started a church called Grace. The one thing that he said that was so catchy to me, and it's still, I said it already once already today, I can't get it out of my mind, is that God's grace is sufficient for all of us. And when that was the moment that it made me open my eyes and realize that who am I to judge? Mm-hmm. Who am I to point my finger at someone's? Because then I started to realize when I point my finger at one person, when I point my finger, you see those other four fingers right there? Mm-hmm. You notice who they're pointing at? Mm-hmm. They're pointing back at me. I learned not to point the finger. I learned not to put people, isolate people. Uh, because we all are God's creatures, right? Mm-hmm. We all are God's children. Beautiful. And so my goal is in teaching my kids and having family members who are gay. I never forget being around my dad when I first lived with my father. My dad had a brother who was um, homosexual. He was a gay man. And he died of 
AIDS. Mm -hmm. Seeing that, at that time, we believed that AIDS or HIV was a the gay man's disease. Right. It's not true. Mm -hmm. It's just simply not true. And to label them as that was is is sad. Because we needed to have somebody to point the finger at to say, you cause this, or you cause that. And that's homophobic behavior, right? Right. So in seeing that, that taught me a lot. And I watched my dad love his brother. I watched my dad be angry about his brother. I didn't know that. Uh, that was part of my dad's anger growing up yeah. is that he had a brother who was gay. I didn't know that until I got older. Mm -hmm. Um because guys, would, people would talk about his brother, and that put my dad in a rage, it, I think, and that just made him really guarded in so many ways. Yeah. But um, in knowing that and seeing being around different people, I've learned to, you know, before I walk in the door, I got to look in the mirror and look at myself before I start to judge someone else. Mm -hmm. And and hearing De come full circle. <laughs> And in, in what he has learned and what we grew up with and what we were around, um, it touched me. It yeah. Just his example helped change me. Uh, watching him be open and be, um, you know, show compassion to others was really a big deal for me. It actually helped me evolve myself and then listening and, and reading books and reading the books that D.E. wrote and Uncle D and and going back and reading the Bible and, and doing research and studying it and, and getting more understanding clarity, those things helped me uh, to develop uh, the calmness that I experience today mm. and the ability to be able to communicate with others who may be different than myself. Well, we learn from each other. There's, there's Absolutely. no doubt. We, we, were, we didn't realize it, but we were each other's teachers. Absolutely. And uh, we were in a, a moving, authentic classroom uh, together yes, we were. and teaching each other. This is my brother, uh, Louis Peace, Louis Lamar. And uh, I'm so glad that he was able to share with us. And he's on a different in a different time zone. He's mountain time in Albuquerque. And so I so appreciate you taking the time to do this uh, tonight. Uh, hopefully we'll we'll do it again soon. I'm gonna come out and give you a golf lesson uh, very soon. Lewis, Lewis practices golf really regularly, and I play about once or twice a year, and I always go out and beat him every time. And if he says differently, he's telling a story. Just that's all I got to say about that. So, Well, you know, you have to show have a respect factor, right? He's a spiritual person in my life, and so <laughs> I want to make sure he feels welcome when he's around me. Take one, and, take one uh, for the team, huh, Lewis? You know, uh, I used to dunk on him and things of that nature. He'd get real <laughs> aggressive and get all strong and wants to steal and get up in my space. Golf. <laughs> it's an individual sport, right? It's an individual sport. <clears throat> but no, I in all seriousness, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, on this, this this with you, DE. Thank you for asking me. You're so uh, welcome. I hope to eventually have the opportunity to uh, to, to go a little bit further yeah. in the conversation, the dialogue and Others can mm -hmm. ask questions about our experiences yeah. with one another. And maybe even me have the opportunity to share on a bigger, bigger stage to talk to you yeah. a little bit more because there's been some life lessons I've learned over the years that I believe can help in so many ways as well. Well, buddy, thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to say uh, goodbye. I'm going to do a, do a little wrap up. But thank you. Give my love to Zion, to Layla. Uh, to everybody, all the family in Albuquerque, in the ABQ. You're from Absolutely. the ATL, but you're in the ABQ now. We love you, buddy. Thank you for being with us tonight. I appreciate you having me, D. I love you, man. Love you, buddy. It's an interesting uh, dynamic uh, having to uh, walk between the lines of assimilation uh, and identity. What does that mean? When Lewis moved in with our family, did he become a white person? No. Did I become a an African-American? No, I learned things about culture. He learned things about culture. When Lewis was, uh, when we were around uh, friends of ours who were gay, did I become gay? No, I, I didn't catch gay. Uh, I learned how to be open to learn from different cultures. When I ordain a woman into ministry, do I become a woman? No, I learned from a woman's perspective. When I engage someone who is Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, do I convert to Islam? 
No, I enjoy the truths that are in their religious tradition. There are there are pearls and and um, and gems in every culture, religion, uh, background, uh, lived experiences that we can learn from if we open uh, our minds. I want to leave you with a thought tonight, and this is from uh, Dr. King. Dr. King talked about the idea of what he called a universal altruism. And he compared that to Jesus' uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. In essence, the Good Samaritan ex expressed a universal altruism because the man who had fallen among thieves was not his culture, was not his religion, was not from his geographical location. He gave something without looking for a benefit to himself. So what does that mean for us tonight? Okay, let's, let's, ta let's take a biblical, historical, critical approach to this, okay? If you are a woman and you have learned how to nuance the scriptures to justify you being able to preach and have ordination and be a bishop and, and have full recognition of your credentials, and you've only done that for your womanhood, there are a lot of other issues that are in the Bible that we need to nuance. If you are a gay man or, or a gay or, or, or from the same gender loving community, and you have been able to kind of kind of understand the scriptures that were culturally biased and what does the word uh, effeminate really mean in the scriptures and what did Jesus ever teach it? If you can take those scriptures and kind of include yourself scripturally uh, as a same gender loving person, but you still aren't sure that Gandhi's in heaven. You're still not sure that the Dalai Lama has the right to be as much of a child of God, but they've got to come through your specific way to God. You are only using the scriptures to justify yourself. What am I asking us? Can we adopt a universal altruism that is not just looking at religion, culture, sexual orientation, race, geography, uh, country of origin, political party or partial affiliation, but you're looking at the totality of humanity and saying, how can I live in a universal altruism, have a quantum leap and awakening, not just to my one issue, not just to my race, my gender, my sexual orientation, how can I get a panoramic vision of what is good for all of humanity and then express that to everybody uh, that I come in contact with? That, my friends, is a quantum awakening. And so uh, I did want to tell one more story, and he, he may still be in that waiting room, but Lewis and I grew up mostly sleeping in the same bed. We, we shared the same bedroom. We wore the same clothes until he grew to be half a foot taller than me. Um, but sometimes at night he would, in, when we were sleeping, I would hear him crying in his sleep and I would just reach over and I would pat him on the shoulder and say, Hey buddy, you're having a bad dream. And he would wake up and say, what, why are you, why are you tapping me? I said, you were crying. And he, many times he would say, I wasn't crying. And then finally, when we really became close, I would wake him up from his tears and he would tell me why he was crying. He would tell me about his hurt, uh, the racism that he felt, the family struggles that he felt, coming from uh, from a, a sense of scarcity. He was raised in, in a housing project for some of his life. And it took a lot of time for him to tell me to get past that, I'm not crying, what do you mean? To trust me to say, this, these are my hurts, these are my pains. Can we do that with each other? Can, can someone from, uh, from the LGBTQ plus community sit down and tell you what the church has done to them? The disenfranchisement, the marginalization. Can someone from the Islamic community tell you how they feel after 9-11? How, how are they looked at after those moments? We don't get into this, uh, this beloved community accidentally. We intentionally, purposefully talk to people about their lives, ask them questions, want to understand the struggles that they go through. And so I hope tonight that we can take this framework, this quantum awakening, and apply it to every human being that we come in contact in contact and context with. So thank you so much uh, for tolerating this. Tonight. Any, any comments, Brandon, that we want to talk about? No, you guys are being quiet tonight? Okay. Well, any anytime we're on uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson's Gospel of Inclusion, I, I'll take the questions. I'll take even the critiques. Um, uh, take your take discussion. We want you to talk to us on nights like this. All right. Um, let me give you a chance to give tonight. Uh, the cash app is um, dollar sign new dimensions two. 
and encourage you guys to be givers tonight. Give toward uh, the architecting of inclusive spaces, of, uh, of egalitarian uh, spaces that we are in the process of architecting even as we speak, not just in Atlanta or America, but all across the globe right now. And so we are, we are committed to carrying the message, the mandate, and the mission uh, and the legacy of the late great uh, Bishop Carlton D. Pearson, who, as a as a black male, wanted to understand white culture, as a Pentecostal, wanted to understand Lutheranism and Episcopalianism, wanted to understand Hinduism and Buddhism. He was literally a walking example of both universal altruism and of quantum awakenings. And so hopefully we can apply that uh, to our lives. Are you yet holding on? I encourage somebody to keep on keeping on tonight. The best is yet to come. CDP has left us. He's in another iteration now, but he left us with each other and he left us prepared. Let's walk this walk together. Let's create uh, on earth the kingdom of God as it is in heaven. As Dr. King would say, it is our task to create the beloved community with each other. And so I want to say thanks again to my brother, Louis Lamar, for sharing your life, sharing your lived experiences with us. Hopefully you learned something from tonight's teaching. Happy uh, Holy Week to everybody. Friday is a good Friday. I'll be speaking at Hillside uh, Chapel and International Truth Center. And then sun Sunday morning, uh, we will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus the Christ and the awakening, the resurrection of the Christ mind man and mystery within us. And so however you celebrate Easter, celebrate it in a high vibration of love, peace, and joy. We love you guys. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Next next week, we will actually take the week off. Uh, I am finding some balance right now since uh, probably uh, about four months before Bishop Pearson passed. I don't think my wife and I have had a day of rest in, in probably half a year. It has been non-stop I mean, just at a, at a feverish pace. And so my daughter is on a spring break next week. We're going to take a couple of days as a family. And so there won't be a show next Tuesday. We're actually going to take off Wednesday as well. Uh, that will prove to you that I'm not as religious as you think. We are taking the week off next week, but we'll be back the following week. Look forward to seeing you guys then. Until then, go in peace. May God bless you. You connected to a love that never runs out. I am connected to a source that never runs out. I am connected to a love that never runs out. I am connected to a source that never runs out. I am connected.